So welcome back to API Days Singapore. Uh, if you're in Singapore, then you probably just had lunch. If you're somewhere else, well, I'm, I hope you're able to take a break anyway. So we're going to continue now on the industry stage. Um, this, uh, this series is still talking about customers and connecting customers, but uh, slightly um, different flavor, connecting customers and data. And our first presentation in this series is going to be from uh, Jonathan Hayward. He's the Senior VP Business Development at Software AG. And he's joining us from somewhere in Europe, in the, the Netherlands, I think. That's um, right. And, uh, and he's going to tell us uh, how there's more to the eye, um, more, more to API than meets the eye. Uh, so Jonathan, if you can just uh, check, um, share your screen, that's okay. Yep. All right. Uh, over to you. All right. Well, thanks. Uh, thanks very much, John. And uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us this afternoon to explore the world of APIs, integration, and microservices. Let me start with some numbers. 98% of IT leaders uh, said that APIs are very important for their company's operations, but only 3% say there are no challenges to their implementation of APIs. 12% of organizations say their integration systems are entirely on premises, but it's questionable whether the rest are actually reaping the full benefits of cloud. And 81% of IT leaders say their organizations use microservices today, but we see a markedly different response depending on who we ask. Now, this insightful data came from independent research carried out by renowned market analysts, Vance and Bourne. They surveyed 950 IT leaders across multiple industries, including Asia Pacific, to learn about their use of APIs, integration of microservices along with the benefits and the challenges of doing so. So let's look at these three areas in turn and discover how they contribute to digital transformation and innovation and how they are interrelated. So with 5G networks coming online along with the world full of mobile devices, a spider web of connectivity will continue to be spun faster than we ever thought possible. And for businesses to succeed in this new connected world, APIs will need to be built for consumption focusing on simplicity and the developer experience. The ease of use and reliability of those APIs will be as important as the ease of use and reliability of your products and services. So as an example, we're all familiar with smartwatches talking to APIs on, on your phone over Bluetooth. And if an app or website doesn't work smoothly, how much patience do you have before you switch to an alternative? When you talk to Alexa, Siri, or Google Home, you're effectively interacting with an API using your voice. And IoT-enabled light bulbs in commercial buildings are already ordering replacements for themselves when failure is imminent. But all of this connectivity is happening via APIs, and every business will be building and consuming APIs now and in the future. Already 31% of businesses' revenue is being generated by APIs or API-related implementations. So everyone understands the importance of APIs, but what benefits are companies trying to obtain? So here's some more data from Vance and Bourne's research. And take a close look at these. You see delivering information, integrating cloud apps and services, integrating other systems, integrate with B2B partners. Most of these benefits are related to exposing and leveraging data that resides in existing systems or even in other organizations. A good example of this is the UK long distance bus company, National Express, great example. They traditionally target customers who have more time than money as bus travel is often not the fastest way to get from one place to another. They already had digital sales channels through their own mobile app and website, but by exposing APIs and integrating with the country's leading train ticketing platform, they reached a whole new customer base and vastly increased their ticket sales and revenue. But such changes are not without challenges. National Express had to deal with a 100-fold increase in timetable searches, which could jeopardize the stability of their core applications. The scalability, along with other challenges, uh, is cited as one of the barriers to successful API adoption. And the heightened awareness and concern of security is uh, likely a result of COVID-19 and the increased urgency in which digital solutions have been rushed out since the pandemic struck. In fact, recent research in Germany 
shows that uh, almost half of mid-sized companies made rapid changes to their business model or their product or service offerings since COVID started. And I hear the same is true in Asia. So I mentioned earlier about how you should give as much attention to designing and managing your APIs as you do to delivering high quality, desirable products. Developers that could use your APIs with ease and confidence are as important to your business as satisfied customers are. You need to take similar steps to ensuring the quality, supportability, and ease of use of your APIs. And you probably want to monitor and control who uses them while also protecting sensitive business applications. You may even want to link billing and payments to the use of your APIs. But have you also thought about other aspects of your APIs? Are your developers uh, maybe also using other companies' APIs? And maybe those APIs cost money. Do you have the right controls in place to ensure that such costs don't spiral out of control? When Google increased the price of their Google Maps API in 2018, there were many horror stories of companies receiving a massive bill from Google due to uncontrolled use by a naive developer. This is also part of the successful use of APIs. So we talked about APIs and you understand the value creation aspect, but where do APIs come from? You may think that all good business applications today already have APIs, so you just need to manage them and you're okay. Well, it's not that simple. The average company uses 123 SaaS applications, not to mention many hundreds more in your own data center. And if you give app developers access to those raw APIs, they won't know where to start. If you ever looked at the API for salesforce.com or Marketo or ServiceNow, there are thousands of functions, each with hundreds of data fields, and authentication often involves multiple steps and is different for each application. Developers are impatient, just like you and me, and want results fast. So it's vital to create simpler APIs through mapping, transformation, enrichment, and composition. I speak to many companies who place integration capabilities at the heart of their API strategy. But you already have an integration solution, right? And I think every company has somehow solved their integration problems over the last 20 years. Some have deployed an enterprise service bus or ESB, while others have built point-to-point -point interfaces. However, there are still gaps. Two thirds of IT leaders said that notable or significant improvements were needed to their integration processes. So we all know what happens to customer experience when systems aren't integrated. I personally hate it when I book a hotel room on a hotel's website and then have to provide all my address details again at check-in. And that gap is set to get even larger. In the last 20 years, your integration was mostly within the confines of your own data center. Now though, cloud is the way forward, bringing innovation and agility to your business. You may be lifting and shifting classic applications from your data center to cloud provider like Amazon, Microsoft, or Google. You're probably adopting SaaS applications to replace aging, inflexible on-premise applications. And if you're smart, you're building new innovative cloud capabilities using native cloud stacks from AWS or Azure. Most cloud strategies involve a mixture of these three. But what's that doing to all your data? What used to reside inside your data center and be reasonably well integrated with whatever integration solution you had in place is now distributed to all corners of the internet. You need a new approach to unlock that data from these new silos in a time when access to that data is more important than ever for your business. So some companies are lucky enough to be founded uh, in the cloud era, but for the vast majority of you, the reality will be hybrid for the foreseeable future. And that's echoed by the IT leaders in Vanson Born survey, where 64% said that their integration systems are already hybrid. So are your integration systems hybrid? If so, are you getting all the real benefits of cloud? Or are you just trying to run an on-premises ESB in a cloud data center? Will your current solution stretch to wherever all your data resides tomorrow? Now, modern hybrid integration platforms provide a seamless connection between on-premise applications and the cloud. They make it easier to connect to data wherever it is and give businesses more freedom 
to choose the applications that are best for them without lengthy integration projects. But they also address another crucial challenge, skill sets. 40% of IT leaders quoted limited staff skills as a major challenge to integration projects. Integration has historically been a very technical matter, requiring expert skills that are scarce and expensive. And SaaS applications have raised the bar for intuitive user interfaces. It's now possible to empower business users to compose APIs and integrate systems using simple drag and drop operations. This allows more technical developers to create API building blocks that business users can then rapidly compose into new business APIs and integrations. So we now understand the importance of APIs and why they must be properly managed. We've learned that most APIs are exposing data that resides in existing applications, which is best enabled using a hybrid integration platform. But is that all? How are you differentiating yourself from your competitors? Because you're not going to be better, faster, cheaper than them if you're using the same ERP system, the same CRM system, the same warehouse management system as everyone else. So to differentiate and innovate, you'll need to develop custom applications that no one else has. You used to do that in massive projects that were complex to manage, it took ages to deliver results. These days, people are turning to microservices as a much better way of managing and scaling such developments. Everybody points to Amazon, Netflix, and Google, whose meteoric growth would not have been possible without microservices. And as an example, of course, Amazon has completely separate teams behind building the dozens of microservices behind their website. And just take a look. The pricing engine that scours the internet to offer the most competitive price that's also commercially viable. Or the availability engine that immediately knows where the product is and how quickly it can be shipped to my address. Or the bundling engine that entices me to buy more by offering discounts on multiple related products the recommendation engine that suggests alternative products based on other users' behaviors, the product details engine with accurate descriptions, specifications, and photos, the sponsored offerings allowing vendors to promote their products in the right context, the customer community engine allowing customers to ask and answer questions about products before and after buying them, or the reviews engine that helps make decisions uh, based on what other people think. Could you imagine how complex it would be to manage all these capabilities in a monolithic application? You would struggle to release a new version more than once or twice a year. The microservices architecture are what allow such development to happen at massive scale. And companies like Amazon are deploying changes to their website multiple times per day. They will even expose different sets of users to different variants of a microservice, analyze behavior, and then pick the one that is most effective. But there is also a lot of hype around microservices. They're not yet universally understood. Advanced and Born asked IT leaders whether their company is using microservices. 81% said they did. But if you split that out by seniority, 90% of C-level leaders said their company uses microservices, while only 68% of lower-level managers said they did. There's clearly a perception gap between the optimistic C-suite and the more realistic guys on the ground. So there's obviously an appetite for microservices. But when probed about the challenges, complexity, skills, and maturity of the technology were seen as the main barriers. But the right technology can help to manage the complexity and maturity gaps that people see in microservices. So we've seen now how APIs, integration, and microservices go hand in hand to create the fabric of innovative digital applications. The vast majority of IT leaders surveyed said that an integrated platform for APIs, integration, and microservices would be highly beneficial to their organization in a number of areas whether it's boosting productivity, uh, whether it's higher customer satisfaction, whether it's cost savings, faster time to market. So let me leave you with these thoughts. Firstly, you need to manage your APIs with as much care as you do with your products or services. 
API management is not a commodity. Uh, and co many companies are realizing the need for advanced capabilities in order to meet the growing needs of APIs within their company. And in fact, 80% of the IT leaders in Vance and Bourne mentioned that, uh, that basic API management capabilities are not sufficient for their needs uh, in the future. Secondly, almost every API project requires integration capabilities to unlock and get the most value from data hidden away in applications and databases. And finally, microservices, um, re uh, the huge potential of microservices being realized by companies, but adoption will be slow if the key challenges and skills and technical complexity are not properly addressed. So on that last point of microservices complexity, I'd like to invite you to join uh, our workshop later this afternoon at uh, 3.30 p.m., where Sur uh, Suri and Pavan Kumar will show you how some of these microservices challenges can be addressed. And um, thank you very much. And I think we've got a few minutes for questions. John. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks very much for that, uh, for that perspective. I can see uh, a, number of, a number of things, and I guess, it can be a bit overwhelming uh, for companies that look at this and say, well, actually, if the CC thinks uh, that they're adopting, but the middle managers um, can see there are um, challenges there. Well, what, what are the things that uh, firms can do to, to, to address them? And the, I think it was the second or the third last slide when you talked about some of the, the key um, the, the key insights is uh, you know managing APIs as a product or a service. Well, a, as with an organization's other uh, products and services, what are the sort of um, talent gaps that you see for you know an existing product manager, somebody who's managing um, a company's uh, a traditional company's products and services? What do they need to do to to rethink or or learn in order to be able to manage an API product? Well, I, I think, uh, uh, John, the uh, the developers that are building APIs often tend to think that, oh, uh, everybody else is like them and everybody else is, is happy to delve into technical details and figure it out as they go along. They don't necessarily transfer and, and think that the consumers of their APIs are like their customers. They are impatient, they are volatile, and will quickly switch on to something else if they, if they, you know, if they don't get what they find, what they want quickly. Um, uh, and maybe also don't think about uh, the scale aspects of it and, and how uh, uh, the, the, the effort that's normally needed in, let's say, the old way of interfacing between companies or um, between applications where you would do a lot of person-to-person handholding, uh, uh, getting people on boarded. Um, in the API world, that needs to scale and there needs to be more self-service and uh, empowerment of the users of APIs, whether they are uh, the consumers of those APIs or in the example that I gave with, um, with e almost like empowering business users with building blocks that they can then compose into higher level applications. So, uh, okay, so that gets to sort of the long tail problem that uh, if you're a big company and you're dealing with another big company, uh, you want to negotiate a partnership, uh, you, your integration team gets together with uh, the, the partner's integration team and you spend a few months figuring out how that's going to work. But if you're, uh, if you're a smaller, um, a smaller firm, a, a mid-market firm, and you um, you want to uh, grow into different areas, um, may, maybe geographic areas. There may be different channels. There may be different. So you all of a sudden have a lot more partners that you could potentially uh, deal with, but only, but but not if you approach the integration in the same way as uh, as you would have if you're a um, two big companies getting together. So yeah. is that aspect I, of 
Exactly. I think there's a good uh, a good example there. Uh, one company that I worked with uh, a number of years ago, let's sort of say in the pre-API era, um, but they really set up a, an e-business competence center, as they called it back then, which was their single face for uh, establishing B2B connections. These were, um, uh, back then, it would traditionally take them maybe to onboard a new B2B partner. Um, but they... Uh, created reusable building blocks um, and, uh, and matured their onboarding processes so that they could get those things down to a matter of days. That empowered the business to then uh, create shorter term business relationships. You know, a shorter term contract, a three month contract with a shipping provider, for example, was then viable which it wouldn't have been if it, if you had to, it takes two, two months to establish that. I think in the, in the API world today, that will apply as well, where uh, a lot of B2B connections are being established based on APIs. And if you can shorten that time, simplify the time for onboarding, that's going to now empower the business to be much more flexible and agile with the relationships that they enter into um, uh, and uh, give them uh, a lot more flexibility. Yeah, I, that's that's a great point. It comes down then if you can simplify the the integration, standardize the um, the interfaces, the the APIs, um, then you can move much faster. But it gets down to then prioritizing who are the partners you want to deal with, which leads me to my next point because you, in the second of those points you made, you talk about um, APIs require integration that is with with data sources and. The, there is a technical challenge there, but there's also a, a governance challenge because not everybody should have access to all the data. Uh, there, there needs to be um, a strong sense of who, who is the data owner and are they consenting uh, to the sharing of that data and is it going to be used um, in, a, um, in, a, in a proper way? And that applies whether you're trying to share data internally within your organization or or externally with a, a partner so can you um can you give us a picture of what what are the sort of governance steps that you need in order to be able to to manage that reasonably well well i think you've you've, you've hit an interesting point there john with uh governance around such apis i mean i mentioned that the apis for a lot of these applications are very complex and exposing you know hundreds of data fields now i touched in my talk on, on the complexity of that and how it's difficult for someone to know which fields are relevant for your organization. But also, um, uh, the governance aspect can play a part in that as well. So by exposing an API that only uh, allows access to a simple subset of those fields doesn't only make that API simpler and easier to use, but it also, you can now select which subset of data or which parts of that are now accessible and then control access to that API rather than having to now uh, deal with very complex authorization structures, uh, filtering out certain fields inside each different application, which will, of course, have its own authentication framework and so on. So by um, creating these layered APIs uh, uh, can play not only a role in the, uh, the simplicity and the ease of use, but also in the governance aspect. Mm, great, great point. And the last of your points about the, the complexity of microservices, and I, I think getting back to the talent perspective, if, you, um, if, you, if your organization is moving towards more of a microservices architecture, there is managing the, the complexity of that technically, but then there is also um, if, an, if you're breaking your organization into more autonomous teams, each looking after one or, or, or a small handful of microservices and everything associated with that, then that team um, needs to be a little multidisciplinary. You know, they, they can't just be back-end developers. They can't just be um, uh, engineers. They, they need to think about how they're communicating with who, who is going to be consuming their, their service. To some extent, they need to market it. So how... How, um, how can um, people of a technical background de develop more of a, a, a marketing instinct for what's going to be useful for the consumers of, of their microservices? 
Well, I think that's, I mean, that's the organizational aspect of it as well. I mean, you you talked earlier about a product manager, uh, and that's probably a role that has not really existed in the, you know, in the IT space uh, in the past. And and in fact, mirroring the way you uh, uh, manage the life cycle of your company's primary product uh, in your IT organization when it comes to APIs and treating them as also as first class citizens, I think is is key to that. But on the skills port around uh, around microservices, um, what we see there is is and I think the maturity thing of the technology comes very much to the forefront here. That the um, people find when they actually try to do this that the technology maturity is not quite there yet, which means they spend an awful lot of time on the non-functional things, getting the framework working, getting things talking to each other, getting things structured, and relatively little, leaving relatively little time to actually build the microservices themselves where the business value is. And of course, this is where I think the technology is playing is playing catch up and um, certainly recommend people join the 3.30 session uh, uh, this afternoon. Um, hopefully you can get some insights in where that technology is going. Great. Thanks very much, uh, Jonathan, for uh, the presentation and also the, the, uh, the discussion. And, yep. Um, yep. Thanks, John. Thank